when Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 11th birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. 111 is pretty old. Even I'm not that old yet. I will not be 111 for another 50 years. I will only, will only be 61 this year. Maybe that's special. So maybe I should have a special birthday party in September. Uh, really, I'm very happy that I will be having a 61st birthday at all. We announced the uh, Pearl 6 project back in the year 2000. That was 15 years ago. Since then, my health has not been great. I've survived two cancers, two cataract surgeries, and two retinal surgeries. I also survived two economic downturns and two layoffs. Uh, it seems I've done everything in twos. I married off my two daughters. <laughs> oh. I even had double pneumonia. Uh, does that joke even work in Japanese? I don't know. So I, today I'm going to be talking about the number two. Maybe you thought I was going to talk about some other number, like maybe six, <laughs> and the letters P and L. Indeed, you might have even thought I was going to talk about Pearl today. Haha, -ha. I'm much too self-centered for that. Those of you who have been paying attention know by now that all of my talks are really about me and what you think of me. Say, how do you like my new hairdo? <laughs> oh, the wonderful thing about Larry's is wonder Larry's are wonderful things. Tiddly palm, tiddly palm. Winnie the Pooh. But the most wonderful thing about Larry's is I'm the only one. I'm so vain. You bet I think the song is about me. A um, little karaoke there. Well, maybe there are a few other Larrys in the world. Uh, Larry Ellison, uh, Larry, Moe, and Curly, or Shrimp, Larry the Cucumber. Um, okay, I lied. I'm not just interested in me. I'm also interested in everything else, uh, and everyone else. Uh, well, almost everyone else, maybe not Larry Ellison. Uh, so, I, I, so I like to talk about everything and everyone, too. Today, however, I mostly want to talk about Tolkien, because Tolkien also comes in twos. Those of us who love Tolkien do so primarily because he wrote two stories, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. You may have heard of them. So maybe we'll talk about six anyway, since Peter Jackson made the two Tolkien books into six uh, films. Also, The Lord of the Rings is a trilogy, but that's because it consists of six books uh, bound together into twos. There's that two again. You know, I could get into this numerology thing. Um, so what if we add them instead? Let's see, how about five? We could go with uh, Pearl Fat Five is like the Battle of Five Armies. How many of you actually saw the last Hobbit movie? A few of you. Okay. It was okay. Uh, I finally watched the last Hobbit movie two weeks ago. So maybe we could say that Pearl Five is like the Battle of Five Armies. In the battle, five different cultures come together and fight. Pearl Five was also a convergence of many different competing cultural forces, and these forces tend to fight against each other. And the battle was not pretty. Uh, neither is Pearl Five when you think about it, but that's okay. Uh, Pearl Five was a great success, and still is. But really, if we're going to compare what I do with what J.R.R. Tolkien do does or did, Pearl Five is like my Hobbit, and Pearl Six is like my Lord of the Rings. At least, that's how I think of it. Maybe you prefer to keep them further apart. 
cheap Unicode jokes. Okay, we can make the arrows fatter too. Anyway, two related stories, two related computer languages. There really are many similarities. Whoops. It took Tolkien 15 years to write his sequel. It's been 15 years since we began the Perl 6 effort. Coincidence? I think not. Anyway, if you're young enough that you're just now seeing the Hobbit movies for the first time, then you're very lucky. You didn't have to wait for them. Being young means you didn't have to wait a long time for the sequel to come out. It already exists. As for reading, The Lord of the Rings was originally published about the time I was born. So I was lucky too. People who read The Hobbit in 1937 had to wait 15 years for The Lord of the Rings. So here's the general principle. It doesn't matter if something took n years to develop, if those n years are now done. 15 years is not so very long. You should be glad I decided to use the Tolkien metaphor for this talk. I could have picked a different metaphor, such as the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years before we get into the promised land. That would give us, let's see, um, 25 more years to finish Pearl 6. That might be enough. <laughs> uh, but that would also make me like Moses. And you, you may know about Moses. They said he was the humblest man on the face of the earth. That fits, since I'm humble too. Uh, and I'm very proud of how humble I am. And I get to carry around a great big stick that I can part the Red Sea and go up on Mount, Mount Sinai and I could carry around the big stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. Uh, almost a giru. <laughs> Unfortunately, if I'm Moses, I also have to go up to the Promised Land and die just before I get there. Damedas. <laughs> Plus, I don't really have any commandments for you. Uh, just a few announcements. For example, today I'd like to announce that we should get ready to party. And we should do that because, I forget. Maybe it will come to me later. Let's see, announcements, announcements. Now, what does that remind me of? I'm getting as bad as old Barlam and Butterbur. One thing drives out another, you know? Uh, yeah. Announcements. Um, yeah, that reminds me of Bilbo and his birthday party. I don't like half of you half as well as you deserve and all that. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Bilbo's story starts with an unexpected party, not a long expected party. Two books, two parties. I guess Tolkien liked parties. I like parties too. Maybe we should have a party or two parties. That would be twice as good. Uh, but not now. Back to those mountains like the one Moses went up. The Hobbit is all about Bilbo's trip to the Lonely Mountain. In the same way, The Lord of the Rings is about Frodo's trip to Mount Doom. And this correspondence really isn't an accident because um, great authors steal plots from each other, from other great authors, and Tolkien was so great he stole from himself. Uh, many of the plot elements of The Lord of the Rings are stolen straight from The Hobbit. For instance, they both start with a, a party at Bag End. And they're about, the com they're about going there and back again to a distant land and coming back home. They're about missing the comforts of home while you're, you're away from home. Uh, in both stories, the travelers first go to Rivendell to ask the elves for advice. The travel party tries to go through a mountain pass and fights monsters there, or then doesn't succeed. Then they go underground and fight monsters there. Then they meet with elves, etc. They float down the river, etc. Meeting with men. Someone becomes king. Hobbits grow up. They meet, they meet um, lots of people. Both books are about growing up after you're an adult, already an adult. 
And I can deeply empathize with that because I'm still trying to figure out how to grow up. Well, if I live to 111, I've got another 50 years to, uh, yet. Pearl is also about growing up when you need to. From the very start, I designed Pearl to be a language that you can learn gradually. So you might say Pearl is like Middle Earth itself. It presents you with a large, larger challenges just when you become ready to meet them. Or maybe a little before you're quite ready to meet them, if you're a hobbit. Structurally, both of Tolkien's books are episodic quests with new creatures to deal with every chapter or so. In The Hobbit, Bilbo learns to deal with wizards, dwarves, trolls, giants, goblins, golems. I guess there's only one golem. Golems are, are kind of like tiggers, too. But the most wonderful thing about golems is, 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 is I'm the only one, my precious. Uh, wargs, which are wolves, uh, eagles, werebears, well, I guess there's only one of those two. Bad trees, spiders. The spiders, of course, um, though the, the, they spun their webs, so they, they, they designed the original wood wide web. Uh, sorry. Uh, selfish elves, selfish humans, selfish dwarves, and of course, at the end of the story, there's always the boss which is, in this case, a dragon, a selfish dragon. Now, similarly, in The Lord of the Rings, the hobbits learn over time to deal with a bad old tree, a barrow white, men, midges, elves, crows, cranky wizards, orcs. I misspelled that. <laughs> Balrogs, a dead wizard, a wizard who ought to be dead, elves who live too long, men who live too short, trees who walk and talk and live too long, resurrected wizards, worm tongues, golems, orcs, Morks, more orcs, yes, oh, oh yes, my precious, spiders. Is. Well, really only one spider this time, but Shelob is big enough to make up for it. But the most wonderful thing about spiders, no, no that's not just do that one. Okay, more orcs, eagles, kings, minstrels. Stick it, minstrels. Well, you know how the story goes on and on and on. It's very long. But for all its length, The Lord of the Rings is still basically a reimagining of The Hobbit. We have a phrase for this kind of reimagining where you fix everything that was wrong. It's called the second system syndrome. Uh, you might think of it as second system syndrome, except that Tolkien actually finished his redesign. He figured out how to do second system syndrome and make it work. So our slogan is second system syndrome done right. That's the Pearl Six slogan, one of them. But by that we mean that we expect to take a long time, but we also expect the pro project to converge on a solution. Eventually, by Christmas. We just never said which year. Similarly, when we compare Pearl 5 and Pearl 6, you can see many places where, the Pearl, 6, where Pearl 6's underlying principles are stolen straight from Pearl 5. Both languages are oddly useful. Um, they use sigils as down markers. They're operator rich languages. Uh, both languages are, are very expressive, but you can still learn them. Uh, visual, how things look um, is important. Both languages, easy things should be easy and hard things should be possible. Both languages uh, use both functional and object par paradigms. Um, they're scalable, they're practical. But there are also some deep differences between Pearl 5 and Pearl 6, uh, just as there are some deep differences between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Let's look at the two books first. In The Hobbit, almost everyone is greedy. The dwarves, the dragon, the goblins, the elves, the men, even Bilbo to begin with. 
So it's actually rather surprising at the end when Bilbo suddenly decides to be unselfish instead. We all start out like Bilbo. We're pretty comfortable in our little hobbit holes, but we're mostly motivated by what we can get out of life, and sometimes that leads us off onto adventures. Like Bilbo, though, some of us discover partway through the adventure that just getting stuff is boring. And the real fun starts when you start to give stuff away. Now, some of you may know that it was my privilege to help um, with the founding of the open source movement. I measure my own worth by, by what I can give to other people, not in what I can get back from them. By any conservative estimate, um, the net worth of what I've given away could be measured in billions of dollars. Now, there's no way that I could actually ever accumulate that much money, and it wouldn't make me happy any anyway. So I found an easier way to do it, by giving it away before I ever got it. And, and my little hobbit version of Pearl, Pearl 5, did save a lot of people a lot of time over the years. But the hobbit has certain fundamental flaws which are addressed in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, specifically, in the second chapter of The Lord of the Rings, called The Shadow of the Past, we find out that the ring, which Bilbo thought was uh, harmless, is a really bad thing. Events that seem trivial in the first book are reinterpreted as being about something bigger, uh, deeper, older, more fundamental. Many of you are here because you like Pearl. Uh, you may think you like Pearl because of its syntax, but really, many of the reasons you like purple, pur pur purple, Pearl, like Pearl, many of the reasons you like Pearl are deeper than the surface features you think you like. That is why Pearl 6 changes the surface features, but keeps many deeper concepts. Uh, Pearl 5 and Pearl 6 are part of the same story, just as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are part of the same story. Pearl 5 and The Hobbit share a particular weakness. In order to be acceptable in their original culture, they both repackaged a lot of the earlier culture without questioning how it all fits together. In The Hobbit, Tolkien used various traditional notions about how trolls and fairies and goblins and such should behave. In the case of Pearl 5, I also adapted existing cultural traditions. Regular expression syntax comes, to, comes from Unix. Uh, the operator precedence comes from C. And the type system uh, worked a lot like awk, the awk programming language. When you first try to do something revolutionary, it helps to not look revolutionary. Uh, Bilbo succeeded by being invisible some of the time. And in a sense, Perl also succeeded by being invisible some of the time. Pearl blended in with Unix culture as if it was just another Unix tool. At the same time, Pearl was being revolutionary by violating some of Unix's modernistic and reductionistic principles. Pearl also worked by keeping its type system invisible from the user. Unfortunately, Pearl was also confused about its type system, and that's one of the things we had to clean up in Pearl 6. With The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien rethought all of these old memes and he reintegrated them into a new world. Similarly, Pearl 6 takes many of the cultural assumptions of Pearl 5 and reintegrates them to fit together better. One of the most radical re reformulations happened in the area of regular expressions, which were already a huge mess in Unix culture even before Pearl adopted them. So, Pearl 6 patterns are completely redesigned. They are now powerful enough to write complete grammars in. In fact, these patterns are powerful enough that the Pearl 6 parser is written using them. I wouldn't want to write a Pearl 5 parser in Pearl regular expressions. <laughs> I think it's extremely ironic. Just when various other languages were borrowing Pearl 5 regular expressions to get better pattern matching, Pearl 6 was abandoning those very regular expressions in favor of something more readable, powerful, and integrated. 
But this only begins to scratch the surface of the differences. Sometimes people ask us, what makes Perl 6 better than Perl 5? <laughs> yeah, how can I begin to answer that? It's like trying to list all the ways Tolkien improved as a writer between the two books. It's like trying to explain Middle Earth. Eventually, you just give up and say, go read the book. Uh, Tolkien is a romantic writer, which means you can't really just explain his world. You have to really experience it to understand it. In The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien learned not to be overly specific, but rather to rely on the reader's imagination. So in The Hobbit, you have trolls talking in a Cockney accent. But in, in The Lord of the Rings, we have black writers who crawl around and breathe and sniff the air. Creepy. In Pearl 6, we also learned that many programs are too specific about how to do things. So we made more constructs that tell the computer what to do, not how to do it. In the future, multi-core programming will rely heavily on code that does not specify the order of execution. So we have several ways to do implicit concurrency in Perl 6. In The Hobbit, the various races are pretty much typecast into stereotypical behavior. Elves act like elves, the dwarves act like dwarves. In The Lord of the Rings, though, Tolkien developed more finesse uh, in his characterization of, well, his characters. Uh, we find elves and dwarves playing contrary to type and learning to be friends. The type system in Pearl 6 is also much more developed than in Pearl 5. It's like moose, but it's built in and based on a complete meta object protocol that allows us to generate new types of types and map those types to various underlying memory models using what we call representational polymorphism. Uh, using these primitives, we can support low level native types and high level types such as roles, traits, subset types, enumeration types, and standard uh, class based types. None of these are really built-in types. Even the metaclasses themselves are defined in terms of metaclasses and representations. Uh, method dispatch uh, policy is, is similarly flexible. No language in history has been designed to be uh, flexible and evolve more than Perl 6, in my humble opinion. This extensibility uh, extends to the language itself. Uh, the Hobbit assumes everyone speaks the same language. But in The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien worries a great deal about the languages of Middle-earth and is always trying to get the right linguistic tone in each passage, whether it's elvish or dwarvish or orcish. The same progress happened from Pearl 5 to Pearl 6. Pearl 5 continually lies to itself about what it is parsing, which means that it is often doing multi-pass parsing internally on the same text, slightly modified. That means that Perl 5 often doesn't know exactly what language it's dealing with. Uh, all the problems with source filters, all the problems with regular expression interpolation, that comes from multi-pass parsing. In contrast, Perl 6 always knows exactly which language it is using in any particular spot. Um, let me illustrate the difference. Here's some Perl 5 code. Uh, to remove duplicate words. And here we match a, uh, a word boundary with backslash B, uh, some white space with backslash W, and then the same word with a backslash one. Notice that the backslash one on the left side and the dollar one on the right side are really uh, referring, are, are, are really re the, the same substring. But we can't refer to them the same way because of the crazy interpolation and reparsing rules in Perl 5. Here's the same thing in Perl 6. Um, note, first of all, that we don't need to have the slash x at the end to allow white space because that's the default in Perl 6. Um, the word boundary markers are now directional with the, the little angles there. 
uh, and our, our back references now start with a zero rather than one because it really is just syntactic sugar for a subscripting uh, operation into the current match object. But the important thing to notice is that we can match dollar zero literally inside the regular expression. Uh, patterns are no longer strings. They are a language in their own right, and they are one of the many sub-languages, um, DSLs, that are, are built into Perl 6. And they are parsed just like the main language is parsed. And it's all done with one-pass parsing. Switch, we, so we switch into the, the sub-language, the DSL, in a scope, and then back out at the end of the scope. So it's, it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings has these other languages of elves, dwarves, and orcs mixed in from time to time into the story. And in fact, mixed in is, is more apt than you might think. All of the sub-languages sub in the parser actually work by mixing in the appropriate methods to parse and implement those sub-languages. The grammar automatically writes a lexer for you, so you don't have to write one separately. All of this happens just in time, so you can change the language on the fly at any time. Uh, in theory, a single declaration could, your, could turn your Perl 6 program into Python or Java or any of those other orcish languages. Uh, but th this works on a more subtle scale as well. For instance, it's trivial to add a factorial operator. Here, the function body just multiplies all the numbers from 2 to $n using a reduction operator in the, in, the, in the brackets there. You might wonder if it works right when n is 0. Uh, yes, it does, because Perl 6 knows how to find the identity value for multiplication. That's cool, but that's not the interesting part. This code actually mixes in a new grammar rule to the old grammar and it writes a new lexer for you, installs it as the new language in time for the next statement to use it. Of course, it prints this since, since we have support for big integers by default. You don't have to say use big int. <coughs> in, a in, in fact, it installs your new language even before the body of the definition. So you can use your new language to define itself. Here's a more classical um, recursive definition. Notice how uh, we're actually using the uh, exclamation mark postfix even before we're done defining it there. And that works. This all works because Perl 6 knows precisely which language is parsing at any point. Whether you're talking about operators, uh, regular expressions, or the various quoting languages quoting DSLs. I think it's really the killer feature of Perl 6 and the feature that will allow Perl 6 to evolve into the future for a good many years. You are limited only by your imaginations and by the tempers of your colleagues who will have to put up with your pretensions to the rank of language designer. Those of us who have designed languages successfully know that there are a great many more people out there who think they can design a successful computer language. But it's, it's not really just about the technology. To design a successful computer language, you really have to be a world builder, like Tolkien. You're making a new place where people can play. And you also have to have a team of companions, like Frodo and the Fellowship of the Ring. I've been talking about Tolkien up to now, so it sounds like I'm the only person creating Perl. Uh, far from it. That would be like Frodo going to Mordor all by himself. Hundreds of people have contributed heavily to Perl 5. Uh, and even on the Perl 6 IRC channel, we have about 200 people logged in at any one time. Of course, many of those are lurkers and occasional contributors. But many of them sp spend far too much of their time helping me. And not just by doing what I say. Um, I learn from them, too. Information flows in every direction and at every scale. We learn as much from our failures as from our successes. 
In the Pearl Six community, we have lots of hobbits, elves, dwarves, and wizards. And we have the occasional troll. Uh, but we, we, we work very hard to find ways to get along. You don't always have to agree with your companions on the road, but it certainly helps to be friendly even when you disagree. One of the things that Tolkien is always keenly aware of in his stories is the timing of things. He gets the calendar right. He gets the seasons and the phases of the moon right. Much of the plot turns on exactly when things happen. Both books have the characters either waiting because they have too much time or hurrying because they don't have enough time. After the breaking of the fellowship, one part of the fellowship is tearing across the, the fields of Rohan at top speed, while Frodo and Sam are creeping slowly over the hills of the Emin Mule, trying to get to the dead marshes where progress will be even slower. But even when our heroes are making steady progress on a journey, just putting one foot in front of another, or rowing down a river, you always get the foreboding sense that the clock is ticking. Whenever the plot breaks into concurrent threads, Tolkien shows the entanglement of those threads to the reader in various ways. You might have two different groups viewing the same sun sunset, or a body floating by on the river in a canoe, or the glow of a, a palantir up in a tower, or a, a Nazgul flying out of Minas Morgul to uh, go out over Gondor and scare the people there. So both stories, The Hobbit as well as The Lord of the Rings, depend on, time, on precise timing. In The Hobbit, we have you know, turning trolls to stone at, at the moment of sunrise, meeting Gollum when he's just lost his ring, getting into the barrels just in time, getting, um, and, and the, the eagles, you know, what can you say about those eagles? They're show-offs. They always like to arrive just in the nick of time to save the dwarves from burning trees or to win two battles or to rescue Gandalf at least twice. Uh, the, the timing of the moonlight, the beam of moonlight that will fall onto a map or a keyhole or a gateway into the, into the mountain. Things just keep happening in the nick of time. We could, we could go on and on. But The Lord of the Rings is all about multi-threading. And the entire progress of the war depends on each thread of the Broken Fellowship initiating an, a, an entire chain of just-in-time miracles that bring all of the resources to bear on the main battle, just in the nick of time. And of course, the war itself is just a distraction to get the hobbits through to Mordor in the nick of time to save the armies of the West. Oh, and of course the eagles have to rescue Frodo and Sam from the lava just in time because, well, that's what eagles do. Well, enough about Tolkien's sense of time. A lot of Pearl Six technology is about timing, too. When we, first, when we were first designing Pearl Six, we worried more about space than about time. We noticed that Pearl Five has way too many globals, and globals are just generally bad news for threading. So for Pearl Six, we worried a lot about hanging every object on the right peg, as it were. Uh, otherwise, the dwarves might get their hoodies mixed up. But different things, some, th some things belong in lexical scopes, or in file scopes, or in dynamic scopes, in interpreters, in thread scopes, or in meta objects describing classes, and in various other places. Later, we also started thinking about having things happen at the right time as well. The progress of compilation, linking, and execution has many different phases of activity, and each of those phases naturally wants to be able to schedule various activities at the most appropriate time. <clears throat> You're already familiar with Perl 5's uh, four main phases. Begin, check, init, and end. Since these run at various phases of the program, we ended up calling them phasers. And when they are triggered, we can say, we're firing a phaser. Thank you, Captain Kirk. Um, actually, we should thank the AUK programming language for, for begin and end. That's where I stole them from. Check and init run at the 
the end of the run at the end of official compilation and at the beginning of official runtime. Often these run together, but if you've pre-compiled pre something and used it later, the check might happen days or months before the init. In Perl 6, we can also schedule events when we enter or leave any scope. And when we leave a scope, we can also commit or roll back transactions. We can trigger on the decision points in loops, whether which iteration of the loop it is. And now we also have explicit handlers to uh, trap both normal exceptions and uh, control flow exceptions, uh, such as return or next, uh, which are handled with exceptions. These are convenient for built-in scheduling, but for using defined concurrency and scheduling, we've got promises and channels like the Go computer, the Go language. Um, we've also got built-in event programming, um, like like any event, we call them supplies. If you don't know what that is, it's sort of the opposite of a lazy list. With a lazy list, you run code when somebody pulls a new value from it. With a supply, you run code when somebody pushes a value into it. Um, just as an example, um, the way signals are handled in Perl 6 uh, looks like this. We have a, uh, a function called signal, which will produce a supply. And on that supply, you can register an act action. And that action, in this case, is to uh, uh, throw a, a, an exception and, and to die. Uh, so rather than having a, a magical SIG global thing, we now actually have composable primitives. So these, these high level primitives have proven to scale well in practice. Uh, and together with our, our hyper operators and feed operators, uh, Perl 6 will be ready to deal with the complicated computations in multi-core and in mini-core processors. So supplies push values, but with a lazy list that I mentioned earlier, you can pull values on demand. This makes it quite easy to represent arbitrarily large concepts without imposing arbitrary limits. So for instance, here's how you can define the Fibonacci sequence in Perl 6. Since it's a constant, the definition is locked in at compile time, even though we can't actually compute the whole thing. If you try to redefine it, it will fail. But this is defined as starting with zero or one, adding the previous two values, and then going until whatever, which means however many you like. Uh, and that, that's sort of um, what you might call an exotic usage of, of lazy lists, but it's really um, for more mundane purposes. Here I can, I can demonstrate something here. Uh, so uh, here, here's a more, more thing, uh, use for lazy list that you might use any day. So suppose you're defining several variables my dollar a, my dollar b, my dollar c, and you want to all initialize them, you want to initialize them all to the same thing. Let's initialize them all to 42. Well, if I just do this, um, only the first one's gonna get 42, right? So I can just make, I can say, uh, replicate that list an arbitrary number of times. And if I do that, then um, if I say dollar c, you see that the, that it has set at 42, but it didn't, didn't create an infinite number of 42s, it only created three because that's how many it needed. So it, it, it's really a practical thing. It's not just fancy. Uh, and laziness in Perl 6 is not just for lists. Many other things, uh, many other things also, um, work better if you del delay them to the appropriate moment as well. So in Perl 5, list context versus scalar context is determined at compile time. And that turns out to be over-specified. In Perl 6, context does not happen until your argument list is actually bound 
to a function's parameter list, then it knows whether it should be list or scalar. Um, in Perl 6, you can return failure from a function without throwing an exception. If you test the return value, it looks just like an undefined value, so you can use normal control flow to handle the situation. But if you ignore the return value or try to use it as a real value, then you'll get an exception with all the original information about where and why the error occurred. So we get the best of both worlds, depending on our preferences in handling error conditions. This results in much cleaner code than languages that overuse exceptions to signal normal conditions. I'm thinking of Python here. Finally, as we mentioned earlier, the Perl 6 parser doesn't actually know what sub-language you're going to use until you declare it. So it, it computes a new language for you on the fly and writes your lecture for you while it's compiling your program. On the other hand, the parser knows that all declarations happen at compile time. So unlike many dynamic languages, it gives you excellent error messages if you misspell one of your names. Uh, most other popular dynamic languages can't tell you uh, that you misused the, a name until runtime because they don't respect the timing of the, the begin phase as Perl does. And ironically, Perl can do all that static checking precisely because all the meta objects can run code dynamically at compile time. So yeah, we, we worry a lot about timing in Perl 6 too. Uh, which finally leads us into today's little matter of timing, which is um, maybe why you're here, really. I have an announcement, said Bilbo. Uh, we made an announcement at, early this year at Fosden. Um, for many years now, the joke has been that Perl 6 would be ready by Christmas. We just wouldn't say which one. And every year, some small number of people would miss the joke and think we were really planning to have Perl 6 out that year. But this year, my companions and I, uh, we decided that we have a pretty good chance to get an official beta version out uh, close to my birthday in September, an official version 6.0 ready by this Christmas. Christmas 2015. Twenty fifteen is an actual year. <laughs> we never promised that before. Uh, and we're we're not exactly promising it. We're we're more like projecting and planning for it and <laughs> hoping real hard and working on it a lot too. Um, but it, it's a pseudo promise because there are always caveats, of course. Let me list a few. <laughs> Caveat number one. If I get run over by a bus tomorrow, I'd expect, uh, no wait, if I get run over by a bus, I won't be expecting anything. Um, if I get run over by a, boss, by a bus tomorrow, you should expect the release to be delayed. Uh, maybe by as long as a week or two. That's probably about what my contributions are worth compared to the rest of my companions. Uh, people keep making me write these strange speeches instead of working. I don't know why. Uh, second, we're all volunteers. Uh, real life or real death can happen to any of us. And part of our culture is that we require people to take care of themselves and take care of those around them because that really is more important than, than meeting an arbitrary time goal. So basically, it's not just me, but each of us reserves the right to die and uh, screw up the project completely. That didn't come out quite right, did it? But you get the idea. Yeah. Uh, third, the definition of 6.0 is, is the test suite at the end of the year, not all of the possible features that we talked about over the years. We'll probably strip out all of the tests that are not yet, not yet implemented and take whatever we have that is passing at that point and call it 6.0 or 6.Christmas, whatever we call it. The rest of the tests will be passed along to be implemented in later versions. But 
we're already converging on a feature set that will support both long-term stability and long-term evolution. So it's time to produce an official Perl 6. Fourth, there's no requirement that all of the current implementations of Perl 6 get there by Christmas. Only the Rakuta compiler, um, only the Rakuta compiler will be supported by Christmas. And Rakuta has several back-end VMs, so we decided to concentrate on more VM this year. And we might get other backends by Christmas, such as the JVM, but it's not our top priority. We're kind of like Frodo and Sam on their final journey to Mount Doom. Uh, you'll recall that they, they got rid of the orc armor and even Sam's beloved cooking gear because, of those, because those would have weighed them down too much. Uh, we're not quite that desperate yet, but the same thing. Uh, fifth, you know, while the implementation of Perl 6 is getting faster all the time, especially on more VM, there will still be lots of room for improvement af after Christmas. Some things will, will run faster than Perl 5, some things will run slower. And sixth, what can I say? It's going to be six. Exactly six, 6.0. Six Nobody in their right mind expects a dot zero release to be perfect. Sure, we'll, we'll pass all the tests for 6.0, however, however we define it, but the online documentation is still a work in progress, and certainly there won't be a book yet. And you should expect some bugs, including at least one or two major uh, security flaws. All of that being said, people who are using Perl 6 already are having lots of fun with it. We optimize for fun. Uh, the good kind of fun. The sort of fun hobbits have even when they're sitting in the wreckage of battle. So yeah, we optimize for fun, but sometimes maybe our definition of fun is a little bit masochistic. Just think about the cultures where parents have coming out parties. How do they schedule coming out coming of age parties in real life? Do they do this when their kids are old enough to rent a car or sign a contract? No, they usually throw these parties for their kids while they're still in their mid-teens. Aren't they really grown up yet? Nah. These coming out parties happen before the kids are really grown up. Uh, just because your daughter reaches age 16 doesn't mean she's ready to tackle all of life's little problems, like hormones and boys, and boys with hormones. So the coming out part is really part of the process of growing up. So what do we have left to do before Pearl Six's coming out party? Um, well, I'd like to think that we're in the final polishing stage. It's a bit of charm school that we teach our kids before showing them off. Um, as Tolkien writes in his preface, after writing The Lord of the Rings, he had to rewrite it largely backwards. It's that backwards business that's the hard part. In any large project like this, it's always your earlier decisions that are in some ways the weakest. So last year we identified three areas that we needed to rewrite this year, and these are, not surprisingly, in some of the fundamental areas that define how things work. It was important to do these things this year because we didn't want to put out an official version of Perl 6 that would immediately become wrong. And these three things had the potential to change how the language works. The first thing we wanted to get right is called normalization form graphene. And you won't find this term defined by the <coughs> Unicode consortium, but it's, uh, it's where we think the future of Unicode processing are going, is going. Unicode defines two major normalization forms, NFD and NFC, which are fully decomposed or fully composed graphemes. Um, but we wanted to pretend like everything has a precomposed um, character. So um, we did that one this spring. Uh, well, actually, Jonathan Worthington did it. Yay. One down, two to go. Uh, no, this one isn't the, uh, not, not that NSA. Uh, this stands for Native Shaped Arrays. This is, a, is about supporting native types and compact collections of native types, such as vectors and matrices, the, the things the mathematicians love. Uh, in addition to notational convenience, these structures can be processed very quickly and in parallel. And again, this, this part of the project is very nearly done, uh, again, by Jonathan. Uh, the only reason it's not quite finished is that it's dependent on the third one. 
And finally, we're, we're just now getting to what we call the Great List Refactor, GLR. And this is the most drastic of the three that we want to do because we needed to simplify the uh, semantics and the implementation of lists. This will, on the downside, this will certainly break some programs, uh, but on the upside, list processing will run much faster and be easier to understand. Uh, much of the arbitrary flattening behavior of Perl 5 lists will be gone, so lists of lists will be much easier to deal with, with the trade-off that you'll occasionally have to flatten list ex lists explicitly if you want that behavior. It's the riskiest thing we're doing this year, but we thought it was worth a try, and the risk isn't all that great because, again, uh, Jonathan has it mostly done. <laughs> hey, hey, Jonathan. Um, and the rest of the gang have been helping out greatly. To finish up, um, earlier this year, I was walking down the street and I saw a greeting card in a shop window. It said, I fail good, which I guess is a pun on I feel good. Long ago, shortly after we announced the Pearl 6 effort in the year 2000, I gave a talk on impossibilities. In that talk, I pointed out that Pearl 6 is impossible, but that we were going to do it anyway. So, we absolutely expected to fail, but we also knew that Perl 6 would be a very, very interesting failure and probably quite useful because Perl 5 is already practical and useful and well-loved despite all its failings. So how could you fix what's wrong with Perl 5 and not get something practical and useful? At the very least, we hope to make different mistakes this time around and that would be at least interesting. Well. Here it is 15 years later, and I can gleefully announce that we've successfully failed. And we've made plenty of interesting mistakes, different mistakes. And we really didn't get done with everything we set out to do, which is not surprising since it was impossible to begin with. Some of the ideas we had turned out not to be good ideas. We also had lots of good ideas that we just haven't figured out how to implement yet. For example, I wanted our compiler to be completely bootstrapped on Perl, Perl, full Perl 6 by now. It's not, it's really written in a restricted subset of Perl 6 called NQP, which stands for not quite Perl. But that's okay. The good thing is that we can more easily port N NQP to new architectures and to new virtual machines. Portability is worth a lot when you're starting out. And we still hope to produce a fully bootstrap Perl 6 compiler someday, but not until our Perl 6 optimizer produces code that is just about as fast as handcrafted NQP code. You know, even Frodo failed in the end. After his persistent endurance, it all seemed to be for nothing. The one ring overcame him, and he claimed the ring for himself. Ironically, Frodo's quest was saved by the one person who least wanted to destroy the ring, Gollum. But even if you know you're going to fail, you still have to do the work. Frodo needed good intentions and persistence to get to the point where he could fail usefully. And he needed the help of his friends to get there. Like Sam said, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you. So I would like to thank everyone who has carried me over the years. I have been blessed to have such companions on my quest to lose my own ring of power. In my case, it's the ring of language design power. Many language designers want to tell programmers how to think. But to my mind, the highest goal of a language designer is not to control how you think. No, my goal is to design a language that is self-defining and self-sustaining. More than that, to design a culture around that language that is self-defining and self-sustaining. A good language gets out of the way of the user and lets him or her think of the problem in the terms the problem should be thought about, not in the way that the language designer demands. Computer languages should work more like natural languages. It would be difficult to overstate the uh, effect of the Lord of the Rings on my life. I first, I first read it when I was in college and it really shook me up. It knocked me out of a computer career of music and chemistry and knocked me into a wonderful world of literature and linguistics. But my college career failed temporarily, uh, and because of that, I met my wife, Gloria, uh, and I impressed her by standing on a chair and reciting Tolkien po poetry. 
Uh, and how different the world would have been if Tolkien had not been a linguist? How different the world would have been if I hadn't become a linguist? Uh, but because, you see, because of Tolkien, I believe in the renunciation of power. I choose to give up my power over the users of Pearl. And that's why I believe there's more than one way to do it. That's why I believe people should have choices and have free will. And that's why I believe computer programmers should be creative creatures, whether or not they believe they were created by an ultimate creator. And that's why I'd like to get rid of my own ring, to throw it in the fire, or at least if I can't, someone else can carry it to the fire. Still, uh, even if I fail in my quest to get all the way to Mount Doom, I have, I've shared my journey with many dear friends. Uh, you guys are my best friends forever. Uh, I just hope you continue to like each other and look out for each other after I sail off to the Grey Havens, uh, which is certain to happen someday. Uh, the world takes away all of our rings of power in the end, whether we give them up willingly or not. Gee, that sounds like I'm planning to die soon. Quite the contrary. Uh, I plan to live to 1121. Uh, I haven't lost a finger yet even if they've taken out various other bits of my insides. Maybe I'll live long enough to design Curl 7. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, of course, that, that also has a downside. I'd have to rewrite this talk to also compare Curl 7 to the Silmarillion. And this talk is already way too long. <laughs> or maybe too short. Don't know yet. Now, I don't know where I'm going, but chances are I'm going to a party. Thanks for listening to this old hobbit. どうもありがとうございました。